been through the dial, had watched the news in a while. Turn on CNN, ain't see none of my friends. Swag gave me the blues, they never walked in my shoes. They want us living in fear, it ain't what I'm trying to hear. Switched it over to Fox, kept clicking, I barely stopped. New guests on NBC, no one that represent me. So I got tired of waiting, sitting master debate. Give me some headlines, it must be past bedtime. Sleeping on me still like I ain't vitamin D for real. Rep your city, play devil's advocate. Wayne Brady gon' have to smack a bitch. Tell me something good, a recipe for success. Give me some timeline, shop session and flight deck. Hey, hey. P, what's next? I started, well, where did I finish? Been killing these nigga right from the beginning. Fucking with bitches who juicing and ginning. We fuck on the comfort to sleep on the linen. Yeah, man. You already know what it is on a wonderful Monday afternoon. Really, middle of the night on a Monday. How nigga be doing? Yeah, I'm saying on color people time. This your nigga COD to K to boy music, aka baby boy, aka fifth of five. And I'm out here rocking with my dog. Talk to him. This your man's. P. Henry Trotter IV, a.k.a. Casino P, a.k.a. Pizzolino, a.k.a. Straight Up P. We at you. You know what I'm saying? And we'd like to welcome y'all to episode three, season one of Give Me Some Headlines. You know what I'm saying? And uh, Give Me Some Headlines usually start off with something we like to call the flight deck. You know what I'm saying? So I'm going to take y'all on a little voyage while my dog stab about to go get some parchments. You know what I'm saying? Little beverages. And uh, get out of here, nigga, while I do this so you get back in time, nigga. Yeah, it's it. <laughs> then we flight deck it brought to you by a little bit of white wrench. You know what I'm saying? And uh, it's a nice little strand, man. I usually don't do a review, but since it's just me and the people, I'm going to talk to y'all this week. You know what I'm saying? Excuse my air fresh. And you know what I'm saying? Got to have what we like to call a little ebb and flow. Got to have a balance going if you're going to be snaking that guy. You know what I mean? But anyway, though, yeah, man, I ain't even big on runs. You know what I'm saying? Everybody say, you know, I got that blue runs. I got that white runs. I got that pink runs. I got that Cadillac runs. I got that pink Panther runs. I got that speaker box runs that make you wish you had the love below. Just ridiculous shit. And really, man, if you set it on fire, it get you high, man. That Check, check. You feel what I'm saying? I don't be on all that extra shit, man. But I ain't even gonna count, though. This shit right here, though. Like, I dead ass forgot I had me one more of this shit <laughs> and found it under my pillow. You know how sometimes your high self leave you little presents? Sometimes your high self fuck you over, you know what I'm saying? I think the old boy Ashton Kutcher, his star turn was a movie with uh Sean Aston. I don't know that nigga, man. But his star turn was a movie called Dude, Where's My Car About? Just losing your whole shit when you get fucked up. You know what I mean? So everything in moderation, you know what I'm saying? Got to have a little bit of balance. You feel what I'm saying? Libra scale. But yeah, though, this guy's great, though. I'm going to take a break. Hit this guy for a second. Yeah, but then we we going to take y'all on what we like to call just a genuine purely strict by the definition cow conversation on wax that what gsh is all about as you can tell from the logo you know what i'm saying me and my dog p shot the first two episodes of give me some headlines and then life started happening and we saw just how difficult it is to do something like this even at this magnitude and at this level because we're approaching it with the same seriousness that anybody else would with something that they plan on putting their name behind. And we just gonna be transparent about what these past couple of weeks have been like, what the process back to here has been like, and just how cathartic it is to do things you think take so much work. It's gonna take so much of your time. It's gonna be so much of this burden, but like, if they're the things you're passionate about, you're going to find peace in that work. You're going to find peace in that time invested because people only sometimes look at money as a resource, as opposed to time, your emotion, all these different things that we spend and exhaust on a constant basis. And uh, so this week's episode, the headline is going to be, we're back, 
before y'all ever even seen this, you know what I'm saying? And that's a funny thing to, to have to approach in the inception of something. But I think this transparency will be ever present throughout. Give me some headlines and uh, whether it's appreciated or not. <laughs> And uh, just to catch my dog back up, he got back with some H2O and I'm filling up on some GAS, some petrol, man. I'm on that white run still week. I just had a little, you know what I'm saying, flight there with the people. Talk to them about that white run a little bit and about what we're going to be talking to the people about this week, man. You got any thoughts kind of to tell the people what we're going to tell them before we tell them? Uh, yeah, I just probably end up camelbacking off something that you said, but um, yeah, you realize that life be life and when you're doing it, if you're doing it correctly, it's going to life back at you. Uh, and so this is a catching people up to speed. This is a, we told people in the first episode that what they would get out of this show is transparency um, and just honest conversations between two friends, two brothers, two business partners, um, two men who are journeying individually and simultaneously. And um, what we hope to provide them is, yeah, just the human experience in totality um, from our perspective. And hopefully there's some overlap with something that you may be going through that may provide you with some insight or something to help you uh, navigate the terrain. So, yeah. Word, word. That's a word, brother. Man, well, uh, we gonna be hitting y'all with these first couple of episodes as far as how we release them in the barrage. And with, you know, binge culture, it's very possible. You guys may find us and then see a lot of this stuff when you're kind of going back and doing your homework on the classics. <laughs> so hopefully this doesn't meander along, but we just really gonna stretch our legs and have this conversation, man, and take this journey with us. So first of all, last episode, Episode two, <laughs> preceding episode three, was dead ass about three weeks ago. <laughs> uh, let's start where it ended. Man, it feel good to be back, P. How fucking yeah. good do it feel to be back sitting in front of these microphones in the flight bulb office, man? How it feel, man? It feels great because this is, we've talked about our dreams for some time and our dream involves sitting or uh, having our face behind a microphone, sitting in front of a microphone, however you, you see fit and to be persistent enough to a lot of times when you have gaps like that, a lot of folks don't come back to it. Like there's not that persistence. Um, and so it feels really good to have fought through the things that we fought for and be back in the seat and not let it be a project that we don't see through. So yeah, to be able to pick My back brother. up and get back into the swing of things and um, see the hurdles, be the hurdles, overcome the hurdles. And then uh, yeah, to be back in the place um, at the end of you know the, the Mario Kart adventure, after you didn't got your cart spun around after hitting bananas and shit for <laughs> several weeks, it, it feels really, really good to be back in it, man. So, how you feel? Hey, bro, it's funny that you say that because you know I love the Dan Levitar show with Stu Gott's podcast, right? Right, right. And I don't listen to that shit. Like it's it's like forty drop three different days in the week right now because they kind of in a pirate radio phase. But anyway, I don't care if it's old. I listen to every podcast. You feel what I'm saying? So I'm listening to one from a couple of weeks ago, but if they were just having a discussion about when's the last time you seen the banana peel thing in movies, like they just stopped doing that shit. And then it was like, also, when the last time you seen that shit in real life? Have you ever seen somebody slip on a banana peel, and the nigga first response was Mario Kart. <laughs> <laughs> Mario, 
Mario Kart real life. <laughs> bro, I swear to God, it connect us all, man. It connect generations, bro. I used to whoop my nieces and nephews. They thought they'd have me on the week as you drive like this. I said, let me show you about a Nintendo 64. Because that shit a whole different speed. You feel what I'm saying? Like, you racing, but everything moving way slower. <laughs> You got to really be a strategist, you know what I'm saying? You be looking at that donkey car, you be like, all right, he going to turn that corner before me. But if I hit that bit like this. <laughs> <coughs> That'd be the best shit, though, man. And <clears throat> I only reference that shit to, to, to speak to how small the world really is cosmically on a timing basis because that's not the podcast from today but it's so relevant to what you just said you know what i'm saying because they were referencing something similar conceptually but uh to answer your question more directly how do i feel man i feel really good man i feel great and that that marker for me is it goes hand in hand with a feeling of peace and that peace doesn't come in the absence of chaos. I always describe that metaphor as being in the eye of the storm. Anybody from the Midwest, anybody who dealt with tornadoes, gale force winds, you know what I'm saying, tropical storm, they understand that it has a central point that everything spirals from. And when you look at the universe and how everything works, nothing is technically peaceful everything is in motion everything is vibrating everything is constantly growing creating or being destroyed and recreating itself you know what i'm saying so when i'm at my best i am not fighting against all of the elements i am at peace i am at one with it and i move and it moves around me it moves with me you know what i'm saying i am the master of my domain my fate my my chaos, if that's if that's what you want to call it. And the scariest part about where I am right now, bruh, is it don't feel like it's a storm. Yeah. You hear me, dog? Is that not I'll say that again? Right. <laughs> it scares me that I'm standing in the eye, and when I look left and right. I just looked right and left. I don't know if people are gonna be able to tell that with the camera. I fucked that all the way off. But uh, bro, I don't, I don't see the, I don't see the chaos. Yeah. So, so how do I feel? Jubilant, overjoyed, terrified. Uh, I'm in uncharted water, uncharted territory, nigga. I am cut from a cloth that prepares you for war. You understand me? It did not at all prepare me for peace. And the the thing that they don't tell you growing up a street nigga or whatever you want to call it, growing up in a metropolitan area with all of the trappings of things that could go wrong, whatever you want to call it, Growing up in certain environments, like they don't tell you that preparing you to be a soldier does not prepare you to be a citizen. That shit, some shit you gotta learn, boy. That shit don't come just. I don't even know what to call it, bro. Like I told you, when I got my degree, I call that shit my receipt. It was proof I paid my dues, took the necessary courses, paid the proper tuitions to get my certification. That shit didn't feel like no achievement. Like everything of how I process stuff was different because of the prism through which I saw the world. You feel what I'm saying? Yeah. So now to have looked at life from a get to the eye of the storm so that you can manage the chaos. And to be standing at, at a peaceful point and not see chaos and it to scare me. I'm happy, confused, and 
wildly overjoyed to take these next couple steps into the un- unknown and the, un- the, the uncharted waters that I find myself in because I have never been at a place where I, I was at peace with no storm. Like my peace always came from a storm I thought would be less chaotic than the one I found myself in going from high school to college getting sick of that college shit and re- being ready for the real world, getting to the real world and then taking on the burdens of three families. You feel what I'm saying? Like that shit wasn't never what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> so to be where I am right now and it to be not at all what I thought it was going to be, man, I'm so happy. I'm so happy and surprised to be where I am right now to be prepared for war with no fucking battle to fight. Just letting love guide my decisions and passion, bro. That like period. This shit feel good, bro. Yeah. And we've talked not at, I wouldn't even call it at nauseum, but we've talked in some detail about what it's taken to get to this point and all of the the energy is taken if it take all the 12 years that's just what it is <laughs> if it take all the 12 years yeah, my dog said it bro <laughs> that's what it is and can you take can you maintain perseverance if it i don't come quick that nigga speak truth, man. Speak power to life, bro. And that, and that's that, but that's I feel like that's what we've been able to do, even outside. Like this is the third episode of the of our conversations on wax. Yes, yeah, sir. In all actuality, it's probably 50 something because I got <laughs> since I'm paparazzi. P, paparazzi P, man. That nigga P got all the photos, all the conversations you did, new studio sessions. You'd be like, man, we should have had the cameras rolling when we was doing vacation. And he'd just yeah. be like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cameras is always rolling. Somebody's always watching. <laughs> paparazzi P, man. First of all, and, um, Angels in the outfield, even though you can't see us, we're always watching. Hey. Watching. Um, <laughs> yeah. But in the verses that we scribe, man, uh, being able to talk about the things that we go through in the moment. And like I, was, I, I recently got to watching The Last Dance and somebody was talking about like Michael Jordan's superpower. It wasn't shooting jump shots. It wasn't jumping high. It wasn't dunking. It wasn't any of the things that any of the the ballet (laughs) that he was able to perform on the court. Like his superpower was being able to be present. It's not, not thinking ahead. Like they, they, he put it, he characterized it by, they were doing a shoot around before one of the finals games against Utah and everybody was shooting like this half court shot to end practice and they kept missing. And then it finally got around to Mike who was wearing, he was the only person wearing a, a practice jersey that was the different color of, from everybody else. He was wearing a black practice jersey. Everybody else was wearing red. Yeah. And they were talking about like preceding his shot. They were talking about his ability to be present and how he never worried about whether he was going to turn the ball over in a big moment, whether he was going to miss a shot. He's like, why am I, why would I worry about a shot? I haven't, why would I worry about missing a shot? I haven't even taken yet. What's the point of me worrying about that? And right as the, right as the narrator said that he knocked down his shot and he ended practice. And it was just like that mentality of always like, I'm not thinking ahead. I'm not thinking of what has already happened. He's I use the past as it all it does is it adds a bigger sample size for something. 
Like he knew that Byron Russell, when he took that shot in game six in that 98 finals, and he crossed over when he pushed him hard right and he crossed back over left, he knew Brian Russell, he said he played on his toes. If I get him hard one way, that's the way he's going to go. And he said all that, and the, the narrator, one of the narrators said, he said that hand that everybody talk about, he pushed off. He said, that was just the maitre d' showing you to your table. He said, that's the, how much effort he was like, all that was was Michael's guy in hand and getting him back into, yeah. into squaring up his body. And so all of those things are things that you realize, like those things that seem like minute details how important those details are, like us getting to that point where we go in this one direction and how we can put life, we can design life to where we can stop, show life to its table and say, no, 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 we stand here, come back to balance, shoot the shot and end the game. And so getting to that place of balance and understanding when you are imbalanced and being able to describe those feelings. Not only did Byron Russell get served in the finals, now he the ultimate out. That nigga life. <laughs> he just can't get a W, bro. <laughs> the ultimate out. Life is the ultimate out. Trying to kill us all, boy, I swear. That's what it's out to do, man. And the the... You ain't seen that movie with Op the Villain because that motherfucker win every time, bro. I said, with Op the Villain, with Life the Villain. <laughs> you ain't seen Op versus Godzilla. That shit dropping 2022. <laughs> Life in the internet. Who got more wins? <laughs> Boy. <laughs> they both undefeated. That's, that's interesting. Right. <laughs> I guess Life got more wins because it's been around longer. Or so we think. Or so we think. Or so we think. But like we dead air got that little laboratory over there in the mountains with all them seeds buried. Who knows if we dig down deep enough if we won't find a different millennia's fucking Dale warehouse with their internet stored in it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It may be made out of a different material, different semi-precious metal, but that shit out there somewhere. Cause I, did I did I send you that shit that was looking at um Roman columns and shit like that and comparing them to sound waves? No. Bro, I was reading this shit for like two and a half hours one day and I couldn't find no books on it, so I moved on. But I gotta look into this shit. Like you know, with 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 masonry and different things like that, like everything's built off of mathematics, but so is music, so are sounds, so are notes and things like that. So the theory was basically working off taking different vertical structures mm -hmm. and showing you what those columns, pillars, and different architectural buildings and shit look like as waveforms because if we had the proper translation for these mathematical equations we could we could really build true to life waveforms and play back the message that they're trying to communicate to us you see what i'm saying yeah it's the theory is 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 that there are messages hidden in architecture around the world that we don't understand how to communicate and if you think about all of the different ways they have created the ability to reproduce music, without a record player, a vinyl is useless. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. We don't have a record player for the architecture. We don't have the cassette deck for the A-track. We don't have a USB port for the fucking... You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I stopped there with the metaphors on it, but like... That shit had me, bro. I was there looking through the Coliseum. I was looking at all kind of shit. Cause, Cause if you look at the amphitheater, it makes sense. <laughs> Bruh. Because <laughs> these things are built so that sound travels well through right. them. Exactly. The acoustics and everything is built off of it down to the focal point of how the seats are 
they make an equilateral triangle with the middle of the stage because like I ain't gonna go into all that, but like that shit was interesting to me. I just leave it at that. And the more I learn about it, the more y'all will hear about it, whether y'all want to or not. <laughs> Straight up, G. No. But yeah, man, not to get us too on, not to get us too on track to 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 start where we are. Right here, smack dab in the middle, man. Let's go to where we were, man. Three weeks ago. Yeah. Right after episode two, man. We just gone, we just gone put it like this. Uh Moves had to be made, and for the longest time, man, when things get to where shit get real sticky, I retreat from everybody, and then I make my moves, I make my plays, because at, at a young age, the shit I was doing, it was better for no one to be able, to me, no cap, to be able to testify to what happened. So when shit was at its worst, I needed to be by myself for my future safety. You feel what I'm saying? Fuck how safe I was in the moment for my future sake. No one else needed to know what happened. You feel what I'm saying? So as I started to deal with more and more life shit, whenever things got to their worst, I always went into my shell. That's part of why I love turtles. I retreat into, into myself and then I get shit done and then I come back. You feel what I'm saying? So... Moves needed to be made, and I do a lot of the technical shit for GSH, so I was disposed and couldn't do a lot of the technical things, so that put a halt to a lot of stuff, and I'll kind of start my journey from where I was right there. Where were you, bro? What what was going on for you? Um, <clears throat> For me, it was... at a place where most people find their problems and that's financial. Um, And then you just realize that that is symptomatic to the problems that we create in our mind and the things that I was creating in my mind, I was creating a lot of scenarios where I failed or I believe in I had failed and it was creating um, a nice mixture of depression and anxiety. Uh, And so with that feeling like I was overextending myself to things that weren't giving me back what I needed to keep life moving at a pace where I was, and this is a word that I don't like to use, but I didn't have a level of comfortability. And so that uncertainty from the financial standpoint created mental blockades and barriers, which we have the similarity between the both of us that when those things happen, when we feel like we can't count on either ourselves or others, or there's uncertainty in situations we retreat and what we retreat into is we really rely on self. Um, And that's what I did is I really found I think hell, I found my hell and I've always known where hell was. Like hell is not some scary place. It's some lake fire with the dude with horns and all that shit. Hell is the six inches between your (laughs) ears. Like it is the six inches between your ears. The, The hell that your mind can create is much worse than any fucking hell 
Like it, that's somebody's hell is that big old lake of fire. And that's the worst place that they can think of. And so that's the one that was sold. That's the Disney world of hell. And that's the one that they, yeah, that's the one that was sold. The unhappiest place in the universe, as yeah. opposed to the happiest place on earth. Right. And heaven is also the six inches between your ears. Like you can create wonderful fucking worlds. We've seen people do it. Man, we get to we get to experience it all the time. Um, and so I allowed the six inches between my ears to be my hell for a long time, but a a whole a big percentage of the past three weeks, that's where that's where I was. I retreated to uh the thoughts that didn't feed to a positive lifestyle and it led to a lot of depression and anxiety for me. So yeah, that's why I've been for the past three weeks and just working to get myself to a, to a place of equilibrium and balance. Um, and to a place where I could open myself back up and be in my heaven, which is with other people. Um, I find a whole lot of uh, joy and camaraderie with my fellow people, my, my lady, uh, my dogs, uh, my family. And I have not been in a place where I can I felt like I was even worthy of enjoying those things. Um, so yeah, been working to fight myself out of that, out of that com complex, that mental complex. And can I speak to something things. you just said real quick, bro? Yeah, yeah. And for for those of you out there who may not have someone close to you who struggle with depression or who've dealt with these type of issues or do have someone close to you who dealt with these type of issues who may not be able to articulate themselves as well. I think that's something you got to see or you got to hear when he say he retreat to himself when he feeling like this, even though he know he's at his best when he's around these people. If you are the friend, if you are the significant other, if you are the people who feel a closeness to these people and don't understand why they retreat, you got to understand the old adage or the colloquialism, the saying is misery, love company. Depression is not misery. That shit is this numbness, this fucking sinking. This, I, I'm not going to go too deep into trying to articulate it because I don't want to bring myself into a, I don't want to be as close to, I don't want to passionately, and I don't want to do a great job of describing the emotion because I don't want to bring myself into it. But you got to understand there is a huge difference between misery, obstacle, frustration, and depression. Misery love company. Depression is a whole different fucking beast. So in loving someone who struggle with it, understanding has to be your strongest tool has to be your first last second third fourth fifth option because as they struggle to understand it you have to be understanding and grow with them as they figure out a way to grow out of this thing because that shit ain't easy and it ain't a yellow brick road that you just see the fucking markers to pass through it and okay you got some flying monkeys you got a little bit of this it ain't that easy. It ain't that simple. It ain't some fun shit where it ends and you never deal with it again either. That yellow brick road keep on fucking going if we do want to play with that metaphor. You feel what I'm saying? So I just, I just wanted to speak to that, man, because I feel like a lot of people don't understand that retreat to self if you do not have a presence of health. You feel what I'm saying? You're supposed to yeah. be up on niggas when you give them the cold shoulder. You're supposed to be shitting on niggas when you tell them fuck off. You feel what I'm saying? When you're dealing with shit, when you're struggling or you're dealing with depression and you retreat to self 
and the next time motherfucker see you, you doing well, they really don't know what to do with that shit. You feel what I'm saying? I feel like people want to have a hand in the process to health. So it's not a negative motivation necessarily, but putting up a barrier to you creating your own path to health and them creating conflict in their way, not being your chosen path that, that, that it only create more conflict that you in the current state that you're in don't know how to motherfucking address. You feel what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, not to hijack like, the moment. I just wanted to speak to that thing because I've dealt with what you're speaking about. So I just want to let you know you're not alone in what you're saying to kind of speak to my truth in that regard as well. Not to put words in your mouth, speak to my truth with what you're talking about. No. And this, you, uh, you made an interesting point. It's like, I had, um, uh, a good homie. Um, I was, he gave me a call when I was out having lunch with the lady one day and her friends at a restaurant. And I'm sure I it was New Orleans inspired. You know, it, it's, uh, it's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, they got some dishes that are, it's, it's more home style black food. Uh, but he was at, he was like, I was telling, he's like, man, I haven't heard from you in a while. You know, you haven't been a part of the, uh, like the little group of entrepreneurs. You haven't been a part of the call. The meeting. Um, it's calling to check in on you. It's like, yeah, man, you know, it's honestly just dealing with this depression, man. And I like, finally getting out the house. Like I'm, I'm at, at a meal right now with the lady and her friends. She's like, Man, you gotta shake that shit up all for you. And my reaction to that shit was, you know, depression, cuz. Like, you know, <laughs> this ain't something you can just, oh man, I recognize this is going on with me. Let me, let me, yeah, let me, let me wobble this bitch up off my back <laughs> right quick. Uh, and it don't work like that, man. Um, I had a friend visit the house today and she's an older uh, woman in her early sixties, I think. And she was telling me about how the past few days, she's like, I just didn't even want to get out of bed. Like I sat in the bed, like I had client meetings and stuff that I just had to reschedule. And I just curled up in my bed and it's just where I needed to be. Cause I couldn't, and she's like, I just couldn't deal with the rest of the world at the time. And you gave me some sh some shit today. Told me about whatever your body tell you to do, do that shit. Cause that's what you need. You forcing yourself to do things that go against what you feel like is naturally necessary. Like we are biomechanical machines. Yeah. Like our body tells us so many things. And like we, the human, our makeup, is very spectacular and we we kind of overlook like how how spectacular it is and how much of a like a wondrous creation that it actually is versus like what everything else is in the world like all, everything is amazing in its own right but the human makeup the brain the organs uh all the things that we are capable of, like the skeletal system is pretty spectacular. And a lot of times we, we're so we out of the, we are the most special built machine on the planet. Show me another vehicle whose energy source grows because the vehicle tells that it needs a bigger energy source. If you overeat and overeat and overeat, your stomach gets bigger. If you overfill your gas tank on your car, that shit spill out onto the floor. You feel what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, fat is energy stored on the body. There isn't a machine on the planet 
that will store energy on it if you just overfill it with energy. And I like I told you I approach the spiritual from a from a from a very basic standpoint and take it from the practical into the existential. You need to respect your emotional instincts the same way you do your physical ones. When your body tell you you have to urinate, you have to go number two. If you resisted and resisted and resisted and resisted, there's a visceral response. And then there is a physical switch that will flip and your body will force you to respect the instincts that it has been sending you. The same thing happened emotionally, bro. But we don't we don't see the signs and the markers. We just feel worse and worse and worse until our body force us to experience and feel and change something that we ain't addressed. So we got to learn to communicate with ourselves. Absolutely. And I think, yo, it's, I think about it from these terms is you have a, we have all these doctors. We have a doctor for our body, medical doctors. We have doctors. <laughs> we have doctors for our spirituality, which are your pastors. And then you have doctors for the mind. And we don't really pay a whole lot of attention to all three of those things and how important access is to all three of those things. No matter how you should be able to design how you experience those those doctors, but I feel like all three of them are in some way very important to the healthy uh, the ongoing health and wealth of who you are as a whole person. You are spiritual, mental, and physical. So you need all three of those things, um, those types of people who specialize in those areas to play a part in your life or you need to be educated yourself or have those types of outlets where because I don't have a psychiatrist but when I'm going through some shit I have you to talk to I have my lady to talk to and we we talk about the different things that are going on with us and like we're not like I read books and I try to educate myself but it is uh like I have to go elsewhere to found, find the solutions to my issues a lot of the times. Like it, it doesn't really come from me. Bruh, uh, I don't smile because of what you're saying. It's because of the truly like insane feeling I had inside of me when you said psychiatrist. You know, um, I, I had a, a significant other who mastered in psychology, got a master's in social work. So mental health was a central part of her professional life and collegiate life as we built our relationship. So anyway, long story short, black folk don't go to no goddamn psychiatrist, bro. <laughs> I don't know anyone who do. I know one or two who went to marriage counseling and that wasn't really a choice. It was kind of necessary if they wanted to get a divorce. They had to be separated for a year and go to counseling because of the state they were in. So they literally only went to a psychiatrist so that they could get away from the woman they was with. Um, it was such a struggle to deal with somebody who added value to people's life in this way on a daily basis, then came home and had a person who treated them like they were a witch doctor, like throwing holy water on them like, yeah, yeah, get that mental health shit out of here. <laughs> I'm talking for a decade. I was like, get that shit out of here. 
<laughs> Bro, when I say I swear to God, I wish I'd have treated that well like it had sustenance and water in it. You feel what I'm saying, bro? Like, nigga. Like, eat, just pick up some of the books that was laying around the house and read them shits. Like, right. I'm so fucking mad at myself that I wasted that element of that resource because I ain't gonna sit here and cap. Like, there's endless value that was added to my life, but we're gonna keep moving forward. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna keep moving forward. It was a uh, endless value that was added to my life. That's worth saying twice because oh, I ain't even gonna flex on that tip. But in that element of that blessing and that 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 human resource, shouts out to my nigga P. Man, I treated shot like a motherfucking witch doctor. Like dead ass. Like hey, don't bring that shit. Like <laughs> I, hey, after eight o'clock, I only want to hear that psychology shit. <laughs> bring it to the dinner table don't be diagnosing me at the dinner table i remember it, i talk about we was it, i talk about before i had even graduated like we had a long conversation that ended in me hearing a long ad where it had at least six syllables and i was like yeah let it be the first and last time we have a conversation where i get diagnosed at the end i don't care if you feel it just don't say it like that ain't like there are no consequences on the other end of this other than me not having a conversation with you moving forward. Like, that's the end result. <laughs> like, it was that serious. I felt so crazy because I Googled that shit. I was reading on that shit for three weeks. I was like, damn. Maybe I got that. It felt like one of them infomercials middle of the night. Like, do you go to sleep in the morning? I mean, go to sleep at night and wake up in the morning? That Chris Rock shit. <laughs> I was like, anybody you said this to could have convinced themselves they had this shit. Yes, and I won't say what it was, because the thing I'll ping pong it back to you on, smack that ball back across the table, a big part of the reason I am terrified of going to one at this point in my life is conservatorship, being declared different things, different shit being on record. When you see them build a profile, how they smear niggas, I'd be like, yo, I can't have it legally on record that I'm crazy as fuck, G. They can't be able to prove it in court. You feel what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> just, for, just for my financial future, because I ain't even going to go into deep detail about all that, but Niggas can't be able to prove I'm crazy in court, bro. Like, whatever issues I have, nigga, we'll figure it out on the outside. That's how I see it, man. I can't go to a mental professional at this point because other professionals may have financial incentive to use what they have gained as far as knowledge. So I'd always have a guard up. And without transparency, like, it's hard to have growth in anything. It's, it's almost no point to it. Um, like you, you can so, have some fruitful conversation, but well, yeah, not to transparency. Do we really find any solution in this shit? So not to do just to kind of give you your launch point, man. How do you feel about psychiatrists? And do you think that's something you'll incorporate into your life? Because I feel like I had the best opportunity to have the, a decade of growth and fucking positivity that I just fucking wasted. And now I'm at a point where I don't think it's something the juice wouldn't be worth the squeeze at this point. Yeah. To get to where I want to be health-wise, I have to go through other avenues to get there because this, like, let's say it takes 15 years. The next 15 years, what is communicated in this 15 years could fuck all that up. You know what I'm saying? Like, nigga, I dead ass was thinking about going to a psychiatrist and started researching state and federal laws to see what the statute, statute of limitations on certain shit was. <laughs> and I was like, nigga, I'm not going to this psychiatrist. Because I can't talk to him about what I really want to talk to him about. Couldn't if I wanted to. Yeah. Started looking up what their Hippocratic Oath is and what they do have to report if they hear. I'm like, nah, fuck it. If I'm doing all of this, why go? And I don't think people think about that obstacle for certain people going to get help. Motherfuckers who really need help. 
<laughs> and it ain't funny, bro. But it's real. It ain't funny, but it's real. But to ask you that direct question and shut up for a second, do you see yourself ever utilizing what I feel like could be an extremely helpful resource? Because I'm definitely not. <laughs> I just don't uh -oh. see myself using it. I was always, because I'm pro psychiatrist for everybody else. <laughs> one of my <laughs> like do, one of my do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> and it ain't even that, bro. Like I'm, I'm kind of the same way. It's like, man, I got some crazy shit in my head. Like I, I had to do it. I had to do it for six weeks. When I got in some trouble my sophomore year of college, I had to go see a therapist or a psychiatrist. I forgot what 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 his actual title was. He was either a therapist or a psychiatrist, but his name was Dr. Spaulding. And I had to go see him for six weeks for anger management. They told me I had issues and I had to go get it worked out. He really didn't help me, man. Cause I shook him in the first meeting and I'm like, I don't want to, and that was, and I was 20. So I'm 34. It's 14 more years of living. I done done a whole <laughs> lot more wilder shit since then. Uh, so with that, hold up, hold up. Now, now I know I said, I'm gonna shut up. You gotta, you ain't gotta tell me what you said that shook him. But could you please tell me what his body language and what his markers were to let you know he couldn't handle the shit you wanted to talk to him about, please? That was it. <laughs> so, so he got as far as way as he could he without getting out of his yeah, chair. He moved away. He moved away. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then he cocked his head <laughs> like he was a cocker spaniel or some shit. And he I was like, uh, I lost this guy. I lost him early. <laughs> now he just doing this shit out of obligation. <laughs> he ain't even trying so to you help. Know how no you other. take your pop tart and you butter it as soon as it come out the toaster, right? Isn't it? <laughs> Man, nigga, butter they so pop tart. <laughs> He asked me what my favorite animal was, and that's like we just got off on the wrong foot. <laughs> and I gave him a mythological beast that he was just like, Yeah, this is about to be a chore. <laughs> but he said 58 more minutes. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. And them sessions was like 30 to 45 minutes. They weren't even that long. Like, Bro, not until you just said that that I realized, nigga, I had I got forced to go to uh a specialist. I don't know what they was either, but it was a long time ago, long long time ago, back in my uh paperwork days is what I'll call them. Uh, and for anybody who don't understand, it is I call it ass whooping evolution or ass whooping adaptation as a kid when i got ass whooping it didn't teach me not to do the things i was whooped for it taught me to find a way to do them without getting caught that i mean i was gonna do whatever the fuck i wanted to i just didn't want my ass whooping like i don't know how you processed it but that that's what that's what my ass whooping adaptation was and when i reached that point of logic and it wasn't teaching me right from wrong i knew right from wrong and it was setting boundaries for me i did i had a conversation with my mom and i said we we passed this ass whooping shit and i never got a whooping from that point on but said all that to say my paperwork days is when i still had silly shit being documented you feel <laughs> the silly shit Never stopped, but I, I stopped getting ass whoopings for it. You feel what I'm saying? But I had I had some shit in my younger days where I had to go sit down with a motherfucker, and I dead ass hit him with the right to remain silent, bro. I remember I was three months into that shit, and the first time I talked to the lady was when we was playing a game of chess, and she beat me for the first time. 
and she did some shit that was too cold. And the first thing I said to her was, you been letting me beat you? And she smiled, and I ain't say shit else for two weeks. <laughs> Lunatic. That's what I mean, bro. They can't have they can't have paperwork on me, bro. Yeah. So your six week journey led you to believe it would have similar effects if you continued to go. I would, I would have definitely benefited had I continued that process for another year, like until I graduated. And like, it's definitely a benefit. It's just not one that I'm. Uh, I do I see myself? I, I really gotta trust that person. That's I a really, surpri- that's a surprising conclusion. Your statement started with, "I felt like it really didn't help," and then you said, "I felt like I'd have progress if I went for a year." You think you'd have trusted him more if you went? Not more? him. Not him. I, it was a white man, and, and not that I don't trust white people, but. It's only so far our relationship can go with you getting into my head being a white, a old white guy in the South. Like we not even peers. And so I didn't, the only person I, and this is being fully transparent, a black woman is the only person I trust to get inside my head and sure I trust you with that information and I really got to trust that person. So until I run across that, yeah, like we, like it's still shit I don't tell my lady. I, I like, did it come through my head? <laughs> now, I don't know files yet, but it's that I got some, I got some thoughts that run and I got, they need editing and I just can't have that on wax. Um, But my yeah. therapy comes from, my therapy comes from this music, man. Like I write down my crazy shit and I get it out that way. And I kind of, is that it's, we have to get ideas that make sense succinctly into this. It's not a box, but creatively we give ideas over musical backdrops. Like, I feel like we focus a whole lot on the writing and like the thought process and capering out our ideas and like the things that are going on. I can I shout out to William Engle. Shout out to yeah, shout out to Billy Engle, man. Um, oh, you call him Billy? I go Willie. Yeah, I go Billy. I like the Willie. Sound like a blues musician. He be back and forth to Nashville, Nash Vegas. <laughs> but yeah, uh, the inventor of the caper star. Uh, feel free yeah. to Google it. If you yeah. write in any way, shape, form, or fashion, if you in school, Google William Engel Caper Star, C A P E R S T A R, Caper Star. It uh, it'll it'll change your life. <laughs> he recently he recently updated his website, man. So like it's it's fresh on there. Like he got examples and shit. Um, I had a got examples and shit. So you examples. already know it's fire, okay? You got examples and shit. <laughs> you got examples. it'll have you it'll have you writing like that. <laughs> I uh but it more so than anything, what I found out about the caper star method is it is fantastic if you're writing something. It is also very important if you are and helpful if you it's a, as a framework for problem solving. Um, so if you got a problem to solve, caper star that thing out. And now when you you hear you hear us saying this caper star, and it may not mean anything to you, but you Google caper star method, William Engel, you will find that his explanation of what the caper star is capable of and ways that people have like people have used it to solve math problems, people have used it to solve uh science problems people have used it to solve um societal issues um from his all of his studies and traveling around the world uh and he's the most important uh formal teacher i've had in my life that i can think of i don't think that anybody has or will supplant william engel and what he gave to me 
as a teacher of anything. And he, I feel like I had him in the most important subject, which was essentially communication. And very few things that we have as human beings are as important as our ability to communicate with each other. And I'm better off as a communicator because I met him as an, as an 18 year old and continue our relationship today. But From a conceptual standpoint, the closest thing I can think of is perpetual motion as far as the utility of the caper star from a writing standpoint. From extrapolating idea that's, that may be infinitesimal and small and you want to grow it to something else or trying to take something that may be massive and abstract. This is why it's valuable in problem solving and bring it into something tangible. And from a writing standpoint where that creates a great deal of value, like is in storytelling and in, in trying to express your point, like you may only have two or three paragraphs to address something of great magnitude. So the caper star is, is, endlessly valuable and definitely we it, it, we probably have said it 22 times by now but google it man <laughs> <laughs> hopefully you google it the first time you heard it and you checking it out while you hear us talk about it you're like oh okay 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 i see what they talk about with that guy right there <laughs> and then we got a mash in it to you because i i definitely plan on he wrote about it on his website and in his explanation of it, but I definitely from a pupil standpoint want to be able to magnify it for him because when somebody like, if I tell you my book is good, the book that I wrote is good, you can be like, of course you're going to say your book is good, but to have other people to vouch for that book that who don't like, we, we don't look anything like William Engel. Like, <laughs> We look nothing like that, man. And for two cats from one from rural Alabama, one from metropolitan, uh, from metropolitan Decatur, Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia, to to vouch and did you to, say Atlanta, Georgia? I said Decatur, Georgia, Atlanta. Okay, said, yeah. okay, cool. My bad. I said Decatur first. And then I okay. said, Atlanta. don't nothing go in one ear and out the other. That shit hit one drum and bounced to the, I was like, what? <laughs> My uh, man, go ahead, G. Yeah, hold on. Let me move the mouse so you can see his name right there. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, I already do it. It's been one of the more helpful tools for somebody who has issues with organizing and staying organized it's a way to organize your thoughts and solving issues. Like, and I, I used it most recently to, well, I taught a, I had an interview where I had to teach a 15 minute lesson and I used the caper star <laughs> method. Prior, prior to that, I use it to describe or to, I caper diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and did that for a cohort of women business owners and got a lot of really good feedback from it. And I, I didn't know how it would go because I've never used it for anything else outside of writing until that day. And that was October of last year. But uh, yeah, yeah, you'll hear about it more often as, as we get more into our music. And to drive his point home, the caper star is you putting something in your tool belt and you will have no idea how useful it is until you pull it out of there. Pew, 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 pew. Equip yourself with that joint. That's all I could tell you. You will have no idea how useful it is until it is a tool you have equipped yourself with. Yeah. It's going to be crazy. Like when we, create a book out of capers that we didn't <laughs> like just the capers like oh, that shit cat burglar <laughs> <laughs> we running all with this one will <laughs> i feel like i feel like he'd be completely okay with that though 
Man, we cut him a check. He gonna be more than okay. Yeah. <laughs> Straight up, G. But hey, I'd be remiss if I let us go a whole show without giving you some headlines, man. So I bookmarked a few random joints, man. Can I hit you? I'm gonna hit you with a slew of them. Okay. Can you tell me what uh tickle your fancy. New dinosaur discovered in Argentina named one who causes fear. I read that terrible. New dinosaur discovered in Argentina named one who causes fear. Kanye West, Derrick Rose, Yeezy Rose collaboration teased again. Watch the Space Jam, a new legacy trailer starring LeBron James. Paul Pierce went on IG live in a room full of strippers. Fans react. I saw the Space Jam 2 trailer. That that joint little fire. Um, very well produced. Uh, D-Rose, Yeezy. Slightly interested in that one. New Dinosaur, slightly interested. But let's get, let's get to Paul Pierce, man. The <laughs> truth. My- whatever he call himself. <laughs> That's the funniest nickname, bro, because people clown every move bro make and his nickname, The Truth. And all I can think is, are we going to source check this nickname at any point? <laughs> Probably not. Hopefully he just fading to black and we don't have to ever mention him again. I don't even hate him like that. I don't hate him at all. I just don't like him. Like, I don't <laughs> want to hear anything from him. Like, everything, like, nothing he says. I'm like, oh, man, I, more, more Paul Pierce talking, please. Like, I, I never, <laughs> never. And, like, but some, like, some people, some people just, just play basketball. Like, shut up that's, and drill. That's my biggest thing, man. I don't think it's fair to require everybody who talented or skilled at something to be good at other stuff too. No. You went to school with niggas who played basketball. Every high school had a basketball team. All of them niggas wasn't cool. Just because they was good don't mean they was cool. You feel what I'm saying? It's a nigga on the end of the bench who was cooler than the nigga who scored all the points. 100%. 100%. Most of the, and most of the time, he the post he. And that's why we love a nigga like Matt Barner stack five because them niggas was stupid five and they was that dude. You feel what I'm saying? Yeah. But they never, they never was Kobe. Yeah. You remember when Kobe first came in the league, they said that nigga used to be in the room playing video games and watching film and shit. They used to try to get a nigga come do stuff. He wouldn't do nothing like, no, I ain't going out with y'all niggas. You feel us? The the best nigga ain't always the cool nigga. And that ain't the shot that ain't to hate on cold. Rest in peace to the guard. That's to point out that just cause Paul Pierce one of the best Celtics since Larry Bird don't mean that nigga cool. Right. So if you accept that he lame as fuck, all the other stuff is just entertaining and funny. You feel what I'm saying? That's why I say I don't even hate that nigga. Like a lot of people hate that nigga, Paul Pierce, bro. Yeah, <laughs> Cause he <laughs> like. That clip of Michelle Beadle, Jalen Rose eating that nigga alive, bruh, that shit like poetry. <laughs> but it's because they work with him every day and they feel like, I man, I'm just sick of this nigga shit. If he say one more thing about, you know what, we're going to end this D Wade slander once and for all. <laughs> once and for all, bruh. And then, like, bruh, I seen a clip the other day. That broke my heart, bro. And it wasn't even the stripper clip. It was him in the Brooklyn jersey during the, you think you're getting a farewell like Kobe? They don't love you like that. During that year, this nigga is walking out of Raptor Stadium and he throw his headband and wristband into the stadium and a nigga throw it back so fast that he catch it. Bro, that shit had me rolling. And but I that's just, the thing I don't like I about like, if they Paul dub Pierce, that Draymond Green, they don't love you like that. <laughs> that that's the thing I don't perfect. like about Cuz, man. He, he positioned himself as I'm that cool dude. 
And then when you he think somebody want that headband. Yeah. Nigga, don't nobody want that headband. And if he just knew he were lame, he'd be fine. Right. <laughs> he'd be fine. And that's bro. a lot of people, that's a lot of folks' problems is they position themselves as I was about to say a name who was a who this guy's a star right now and has been for some time, but I just I don't think he's that guy. I've never thought he was that guy. He's like the guy who I who you you say he's not funny. He's just committed to to comedy. <laughs> he's not funny. He's Paul Pierce isn't cool. He just commits himself to this is who I'm gonna be. Like that's right. why the nigga wore his headband like Slim from One Twelve off one ear. You ain't Slim, nigga. I don't think nobody peep that like. Nigga, you ain't slim. Like that nigga wasn't never cool, bro. He yeah. wore the the the, the uh, <laughs> niggas gonna go back and look at it playing days, see that headband and hate that nigga even a little bit more. I do not hate this nigga. I just know he lame. Right, right. So I enjoyed rooting against that lame ass nigga who played for the excuse me, since I was and I don't have no issue with him, but I call him how I see him. You feel what I'm saying? We might beat that in the post. That nigga P made a stink face. <laughs> yeah. They gonna be like, what he say about the Celtics? Guys, hmm. I, just don't, I just don't have that kind of love for him. Nah. Like he played with two guys, and like the more I learn about Kevin Garnett, I'm like, yeah. Like he kind of positioned himself as a tough guy. He, he's not who he is. Um. Yeah. But. It uh, just be yourself, and I can tell. But like, people not stupid. Like, I can tell when people not being themselves. And Paul Pierce, bro, one of them be niggas formed the first super team of this era, and still hold the record for the championship that took the most amount of games to win a championship. That was Doc Rivers. <laughs> them niggas had two series go seven. Two more go six. They had the first super team of this, the first big three, and it took them the most games it took anybody to win a championship. And that's the one that validate them niggas' egos. Ray went and won on another team. And they say, you ain't a part of this Boston greatness. Nigga, what? The one that validate y'all bum ass niggas is the one that took more games than any champion in history. And y'all the first big three of this era? Fuck out of here. Boston could kiss my whole ass as a Laker fan, as a fan of NBA, as a fan of cities that's not racist. Uh, put that in your tourism booklet. Y'all don't care, cuz. I do want to go up there. I be up there, cuz. That's what I'm saying. I be up there. I be in New Haven, because I love New Haven. I don't be in Boston like that. Shouts out to New Haven, Connecticut. Oh, man, the museums and stuff, man. I bet they, I bet there's nuts up there. I'm a huge museum buff. Oh, you know, I be in I that went, guy, bro. I be in yeah, that guy. I, I went to New York and went to all the museums. But the I can't the first enough. time I went, I promised myself to walk through without any any assisted listening or anything like that so that I could go back and then get like really deep into it. The first time I just go and I get lost in it, you know what I'm saying? Plus, you know, it would date shit. Now I go back, I be just mobbing as I go through and I'm doing different, you know, handling business, you feel what I'm saying, on the move. And then I be like, you know what, I got two hours. Let me stop through New Haven before I go to New York. So... You know what I'm saying? You break that off in the schedule. But New Haven, when you coming through the Northeast, bro, if you could break off and go through New Haven, if you ain't never wasted that time, man, you're going to have to leave about an hour and a half, two hours for the train. And then whatever time you're going to fuck off. But New Haven, a fire city to walk around. Because, you know, Sawana made me fall in love with walking towns. Like, Nigga, you get off in New Haven and just stick and move for nigga a whole day till the sun go down. It'd be a beautiful day. Cause it don't really be too it ain't it ain't humid like down here. You feel what I'm saying? Like that shit with the move. Middle of the summer. One ain't hot, nigga. I was just like, chilling. Yeah. I'm gonna have to add that to my uh 
Shit with this. Let's find a way to get paid to go. Probably not gonna be for GSH with all the shit I'm talking. We can go perform some music though. <laughs> <laughs> LeBron to hook us up. He just bought the red socks. It don't matter how much they hate you if you cashing out. Man, lovely. Piece of the red socks. Mm. So pretty much the consensus on that headline is Paul Pierce of soccer. I ain't even got to read this because it's. I forgot how we went down. I was born. I was like, man, how do we get on this fucking subject? Why was we talking shit about Paul Pierce? <laughs> I'm glad it, it wrapped back around to the show. <laughs> I, was, I was like, how the fuck did we. Why did we do this to Paul Pierce? He didn't With deserve it. Yes, he, he did deserve it. No, he did because this is the most beautiful thing. He did the connection point. Man, did that look like a good mental health afternoon. <laughs> if he had a stressful week, if he was like, man, I got to go blow some steam off, man, we ramping up toward the playoffs. They're going to be on my ass every other night. You feel what driving. I'm saying? <laughs> man, and I think that's the biggest thing. Niggas is like, you know what? Gambling, strippers, Paul Pierce, he's all right. No, he not. Gambling and strippers are all right. Paul Pierce is just in the frame. Don't let him confuse you. You don't, don't let him do cool Pierce. shit that you think he's cool. Like, that's be cool. mad that you can't see the rest of the stripper kind of truth in the way. <laughs> <laughs> she just behind. He's trying to, he got to make shit, man. Yeah, that guy. Uh, he got that painted on hairline trying to get Jalen Rose tight up. They, they cut him loose? Together. Yeah, they cut him loose today. That's petty. That what happened when you work for Mickey Mouse, though. <laughs> yeah. Mickey Mouse don't want nothing clapping. That nigga wear white gloves so you can see his hands when they in front of his body. That's just weirdo shit. That rat got black hands, that's what you're telling me? That nigga ain't got... N- <laughs> Like why they got gloves on their motherfucking mouse, man? That shit that's is- why though. That's how that's how the animators explain it. So you can see his hands when they in front of his body, because they just be black circles or some shit. I guess it's the it's the forties or whatever they was doing them shits. Because he always doing this. <laughs> like, <laughs> is that him who be doing the giggle? They, they put their hand on their mouth. Let me see, see him form a little bit, but I need to cut that, uh, cut his eye up a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, sausages, really good color on our sausages over here. And like, I love this crust that I get on the edges of it. Um, and so I'll take the spatula and I'll press it down because you see how you get that upward bend uh, in the sausage. We want to get, obviously, you, you know, you're looking for that good sizzle. Looking for that good sizzle. Sounds good. You know, it don't just taste good, you know, the sounds are cooking. You got to sound good, too. If it sounds good, you know, the food going to taste good. Yeah, yeah. So there we go. Oh yeah. So that's what we're looking for. So we see that it is a little bit less than uh, four. So a little bit, probably around medium is where it is right now. I'm hovering around that, and you're starting to see uh, the pancakes rise, and you see that butter and that canola oil mixing in there, and you get that look, that bubbly look to it, and you can start to see these chocolate chips. Um, now these are a little bit bigger and um, um, what is the word I'm looking for? They're round and a little bit bigger. Uh, so the ones we used to use, they don't usually melt into the uh, into the pan, but these do. Um, but it is helpful when that gets that chocolate gets into the butter, it gets into the oil, and so whenever you start to move the pancakes around, um, you get that. So you see that. 
chocolate bubbling up there, it's gonna get into the pan. And so whenever I shift these around a little bit, that chocolate's gonna get onto like the entire pancake. Um, and so yeah, it's, it makes for a really, really good um, full taste uh, of chocolate like throughout the entire pancake. So you don't just get bites of chocolate throughout, you get more intense bites of chocolate um, throughout, but the entire pancake has a little bit of, uh, has a little bit of chocolate taste to it. Um, so check that in on our sausage. It looks like it's doing good over here. It might be ready to come off here in a second. Yeah, we're gonna put that over for probably another 30 seconds or so. And we're gonna pull that up off of there. Um, you can see that's kind of, I mean, it depends on how you like your sausage. We like ours a little bit um, a little burnt, um, but it just depends on how you like yours. So I see these, these guys up here rising. Um, and you're starting to see where it's about to bubble up. Um, you're starting to see those little pockets on um, it's in there. You see those pockets of bubbles. And so it's gonna be close to time to flip. I'm gonna flip one of them a little, what I think is a little early. Um, we just gonna see what we got on the other side. And I'll flip the other ones like on time. So I, I did flip too early. Cause that's the color I want. Um, it's like a little bit darker around the edges and um, it's going to be a little bit dark in the middle and then in the, um, I don't know what part of science this is, but uh, like I guess you would call it a cell, like the cell brain on the outside, a little bit darker um, and then the rest of it a little bit lighter, uh, but a little darker coloration. Uh, yeah, this, I like what I got out of those. I really like the way that color came out. Uh, over here on the sausage, I'm just going to cut that off and let it sit on the griddle for a minute. And so we're going to get over here. This one like it's been ready for me to flip it. Go ahead and do that. We can do that guy's service. And so yeah, we, we don't have even coverage, uh, which is what I want to avoid, but at the same time, it's not the worst thing in the world. And we'll go ahead and flip this guy. See what he had. Yeah. And so you see how I'm moving it around and the batter is in a good place when you can uh, when the uh, you can move around the entire pancake and you don't see the batter on the other side from where you the spot where you moved it from. And so if you can see that smoke that's coming from the uh, I'm gonna turn it down just a little bit because that's chocolate. And so I like to move that around and get that chocolate on the entire bottom of the pancake. You know, that chocolate's gonna obviously burn a little bit when it's a little hot because um, it doesn't have the threshold that that oil has and that butter has. And so you're gonna start to get a little bit of smoke in there. So that's perfectly fine. Uh, but yeah, we're in a good spot with this guy right now. Um, I'm liking what I'm seeing, liking what I'm getting. Um, I, what I'm gonna do is put a little bit more oil in the pan so we can uh, uh, mitigate that chocolate burning. And I might have put another teaspoon of oil in there. Um, not too much, but crazy them out. But yeah, we got our pancakes. Got our sausage, like my guy over here, and a random dustpan. That the lady might have been cleaning. Saturday, that's cleaning day. But yeah, we have a, a couple more to cook. Um, I may go through that process and s to show you how usually it's the second batch that comes out a little bit better than that first batch. But um, yeah, we're gonna get this first batch over and I'm gonna. Let everybody see what that looks like, and yeah, we're gonna move forward with our pancakes. Cousin got me so high that I spill on my clothes. Oh, and then we're getting pissed because the dispensary closed. Hold up. Ask me why I go to get fresh air. Uh -huh. Carolina, why I go to test limits. Why I found that a threesome. Uh -huh. Take a look and fence and track the blue motorcycles. Yeah. Feeling like dick for higher $40. Uh -huh. A glass of wine, student loans in the fall. Uh -huh. Made some mistakes and then making some art. I got 
Got two bouncing on me, couldn't tell them apart. Slime down I 10 with a brick in the car. Down west, I'm a smelling like a house in a Jeep. Final four, just the moose and me. When I'm high, when I'm high. So hopefully you can see everything here. All right, so again, we'll go over the ingredients. We have self-rising flour. Can I the self-rising flour that I use most? Well, most recently, uh, we have the organic egg. Uh, don't have to be organic, just the need an egg. Uh, we have milk, butter, canola oil, and some type of sugar. Um, so we, today we're using chocolate chips. All right, and we can get to mixing. Um, so I've already put the flour into the pan. The next thing we would do is, I like to throw in the chocolate chips. Um, however many you want, we usually do a good amount. Uh, Charlotte really likes Chocolate chips, she like them pretty heavy on the chocolate side. Obviously, she like her chocolate. <laughs> yeah, so, let's see if you can see. Um, a lot of my very tiny, so. Um, I guess you probably had to quantify that there's about 50 chocolate chips and then 50 to 50 to 65 ish, I guess. Uh, but, so we have our pan is heated a little bit. And what we're going to do is we're going to toss that butter. Um, and so we talk about quantities. I don't measure a whole lot, honestly. And so I, this is a new. Let's see how much I grab in. Put that in there. And let that melt. And I grab another one. Put that in there. So it's. I'm going to go ahead and work out my back of the tea. I'm going to turn that down a little bit. And what I want it to do is to be liquefied by the time I get everything uh, mixed into it. And make it so you don't want it to be too runny. You don't want it to be. Do this thing. Uh, you don't want it to be too runny, you don't want it to be too thick, uh, you want a nice, smooth consistency. Um, so right now, it is, yeah, it's not what I want it to be, so I'm going to put a little bit more milk in here. And this is a untried scientific process. Um, we do just figure it out as you go along. Uh, you crack your egg in here, that's going to add, once you crack your egg in here, that's going to add a little bit more um, liquid as well. Um, so you have to kind of factor that in so you don't over liquefy that guy. Um, and once you get it kind of liquidy, you can go ahead and add in your butter. Uh, so, let's see. Yeah. And once you get it to that point, you can kind of add this butter in here. Add that butter. And that's once you get it liquefied, that's when you want to add the butter so the butter can mix around in there. Um, you don't want the butter in there to be laying on top of your uh, um, laying on top of your flour because it won't get spread around with everything. In there. And, then, and so once you pour out that butter into your uh, um, 
into your bowl. You want to pour a little bit of canola oil in the pan with that butter that is kind of still on the, and I'll show you what that looks like. It's not too hot, so I'll grab it. I don't see it, have it. Butter residue is in there. Put a little bit of canola oil in there. Just keep mixing it together. And you want to fill the bottom of your pan with that. And you want to spread it around a little bit. And we'll spread that around. Spread that around. Spread that around. And see what that looks like. Spread around. And pick up that oil and that butter together. And you can finish mixing your batter. And you're going to do a pretty good mixing job. The uh, color you're looking for is kind of an off white color. A um, little bit of a yellowish tint to it. Um, I don't really know exactly. Not tan, but uh, like a sandish color. And I think I'm getting a nice, good consistency with how I've gotten this thing done here. I'll let you guys see it once I uh, finish mixing up a little bit. And let's see. A mother and a father and a child both neglected. A little so bit. See that a little and bit there? Yeah. And I'll give you a kind of over top view of, uh, of what it looks like once we get it mixed in this bowl here. At least your birthday. But yeah, I'll learn how to make these pancakes. Um, back in the day, I think I started six years old. I've uh, been making them myself. My mom was making them for me. The whole time I lived in her house, up until I was 17, and I've been cooking them for women ever since. Essentially, uh, for a special one. Not just anyone. Uh, but I like for me to make this process a little bit easier so I can get some consistency when I pour in the pancakes uh, to the La Crusade is put the batter into a measuring cup. Um, it makes, I learned that when I was in Wyoming, it makes that process a little bit easier when you, when you pour it into the uh, La Crusade and get a more consistent uh, size for each pancake when you do it this way instead of scooping it uh, in and out with the wooden spoon. If you can see my, my little man walking his way around. Can you see? Good boy. That's it. That's it for me. Good boy. Stay right there. Okay. Yes. My uh, sous chef saint. My guy. But here we go. What we're going to do is... Yeah. 
lower. Uh, what you're looking for on the top of these, going to be down, is some bubbles that are going to start rising up uh, on the top once it starts to cook through. And that's how you know you need to flip them. Uh, but we haven't gotten to that spot yet. Or you start to see, see them form a little bit, but I need to cut that because uh, it's eye up a little bit more. Both my papa dead and gone, but a quick legacy. Really good color on our sausages over here. And like I love this crust that I get in the edges of it. Um, and so I'll take the spatula and I'll press it down. You see how you get that upward bend uh, in the sausage. And we want to spread it out of the Looking for that good food. Sounds good. You know, it don't just taste good, you know, the sounds are cooking. You gotta sound good too. If it sounds good, you know the food gonna taste good. There you go. So there we go. Oh yeah. So that's what we're looking for. So you see that it is a little bit less than the uh, four, so a little bit, probably around medium is where it is right now. I'm hovering around that. And you're starting to see uh, the pancakes rise. And you see that butter and that canola oil mixing in there and you're getting that little, that bubbly look to it. And you can start to see these chocolate chips. Um, and these are a little bit bigger and uh, um, what is the word I'm looking for? They're round. And, a little bit bigger uh so the ones we used to use they don't usually melt into the uh, into the pan but these do um but it is helpful when that gets that chocolate gets into the butter it gets into the oil and so whenever you start to move the pancakes around um you'll get that so you see that chocolate bubbling up there it's gonna get into the pan and so whenever i shift these around a little bit that chocolate's gonna get onto like the entire pancake um and so yeah, it's, that makes for a really, really good um, full taste uh, of chocolate like throughout the entire pancake. So you don't just get bites of chocolate throughout. You get more intense bites of chocolate um, throughout, but the entire pancake has a little bit of uh, has a little bit of chocolate taste to it. Um, so check back in on our sausage. My head like it's doing good over here. It might get ready to come off here. Yeah. I see those little pockets on get you in there you see those pockets of bubbles so it's gonna be close to time to flip I'm gonna flip one of them a little what I think is a little early um we just gonna see what we got on the other side and I'll flip the other one like one time so all right I did flip it early because that's the color I want um it's like a little bit darker around the edges and um, it's going to be a little bit dark in the middle, and then in the, um, I don't know what part of science this is, but uh, like I guess you call it a cell, like the cell brain on the outside, a little bit darker, um, and then the rest of it a little bit lighter, um, but a little darker coloration. Yeah, this, I like what I got out of those. I really like the way that color came out. Uh, over here on the south, I'm just going to cut that off and let it sit on the griddle for a minute. So we're gonna get over here. This one's like it's been ready for me to flip. Go ahead and do that. Do that guy's service. And so yeah, but we don't have even coverage, uh, which is what I want to avoid, but at the same time, it's not the worst thing in the world. Uh, we'll go ahead and flip this guy. See what he had. Yeah. And so you see how I'm moving it around the, the batter. It's in a good place when you can uh, when the uh, you can move around the entire pancake, you don't see batter on the other side from where you the spot where you moved it from. And so you can see that smoke that's coming from the uh, 
uh, I'm going to turn it down just a little bit because that's chocolate. And so I like to move that around and get that chocolate from the entire bottle of the pancake. There we go. That chocolate's going to obviously burn a little bit when it's a little hot because um, it doesn't have the threshold that that oil has and that butter has. Oh, man, I want to jump into some more headlines. I'm skipping these DMX ones, man. Get well soon is all I can say to the to the God, man. I mean, yep. When they like rejoicing and, and pain, I got some man. great stories about him. He's one of my, he's my uh, first. The floor is yours. Rapper. The oh, floor man. is yours. We ain't even gonna talk about the negative thing. Just love on, love on X for a second. Oh, the floor is yours, G. Oh man, so seventh grade, I think is when my mom wouldn't buy me rap CDs. Um, the first <laughs> rap CD I ever got was uh, Bone Thugs and Harmony, uh, Eternal, in 19, Eternal 1999. Um, and then the next one I got was um, DMX. And then What's the single that, off of Eternal? Uh, that was the one that had uh crossroads okay got you. um oh yeah it had a couple of other ones but crossroads was, i think probably was the biggest one and then i got and then there was x man like i didn't know dmx for flesh of my flesh blood of my blood i met him with like party up and shit. i was like man this mother he'll hard and then i went and started i got and then there was x went to fye for your entertainment Stood in the line, got that joint for twenty one ninety nine. Came out. You in Atlanta? Oh, uh, I was in Mobile, Bel Air okay. Mall, man. Yeah, <laughs> in Bel Air, Bel Air Mall. Um, went to the uh, to the Fye over there, and I used to have this rotation of CDs. I got a CD player. I went on a trip to some part of Florida and got this cool ass Sony CD player, and I had on on the way to games, seventh or eighth grade year, I forget which year it was. Might have been seven. I'm pretty sure it was seven. Um, I would listen to, and then there was X to get ready for the game. And then I had Cisco, uh, no, it was Drew Hill. Whoa. It was Drew Hill on the way and leaving. And then I had, um, it was a, I don't want to say it was Backstreet Boys. I think it was a Backstreet Boys dude back then. Because I was... Okay, okay. Yeah, I was right. Right, exactly. I ain't bad at you. I got a playlist right now. I ain't even... Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Man, DMX, DMX saved my life, for real, for real. Because he started talking about things I was dealing with as a kid. And I was like... He, he was talking about it in adulthood. And I was feeling that shit as a kid. All yeah. the prayers and, and the shit that he was saying, man. And... Um, he wrote a song called Fame. Like I still listen to it religiously. Um, like a lot of the things that he wrote, he was the most honest adult I had in my life. Like growing up in the South, everybody kind of kind of shields you. Like outside my uncles, um, but growing up in the South, most black women try to shield you from like all the all the difficult shit, man. And he was when you get that kind of that injection of honesty. And somebody who's living, he was very flawed and he didn't run away from how flawed, he doesn't run away from how flawed he is. He talks about where he is in his life and how he's working to get better. And um, man, he got this one shit. Uh, but he go through this story. It's a story that he, he, he's great at telling stories. Um, but I forget the fucking name of this song, but it's a, it's one of the greatest songs. Is it I've slipping? Heard. It's not slipping. It's from okay. that, uh When you say stories, that wasn't the first one to come to mind. It started all bro. It's like I kick it to shorty to try to help him understand. He don't work because yo, that's my little man. He asked a few questions about the game and I told him. So when he made a bad move, it was my place to scold him. Never told him nothing wrong. Kept it fair. He didn't listen, so I might as well have been talking to the air. Everybody makes a mistake. A mistake is all right. But if it ain't, I'm going to tell you straight. Time to say good night. No, like, nobody likes to be played, regardless of relationships. But shorty's fucking up big time. I hate this shit. I 
man, being caught in the middle of being a real nigga, no one was expecting to me as a real nigga. My next move is crucial. What do I do? How do I keep it real with Shorty and my crew? I didn't want to kill him, so instead of putting the Mac on him, I did the only thing I could do, turn my back on him. Here we go again. <laughs> but that song hard. No, I didn't let you, I, I, I didn't let you walk it out. I knew you'd get there, bro. <laughs> so yeah. you gotta let your dog walk it out, kid. Hold up, man. I gotta do my. I don't want to lose my eighty-four day streak, man. So I gotta start on the Spanish lesson. I'm gonna let you take the mic. <laughs> How long the lesson is? Uh, like a few minutes. Gonna you gotta talk out loud. Nah. Can you talk out loud? Do it. Oh yeah, do it. Oh, that's a bit. This is a conversation on wax. This will be a weird end to the episode. Yeah. How long the runtime been? Have you been keeping track? Uh, no. La granja. Levántate de esa silla, Manuel. Hold on. Oh, oh, oh. Get up from that. You telling man. Manuel to wash his hands? Get up and wash what? Uh, get up, get up from that seat. Oh, you said Levanta I yeah, thought you said, <laughs> but I thought you said something totally different. <laughs> Coges estas bolsas y la llevas a la cocina. Can you take yeah. these bags and carry them to the kitchen? Nah, I should have heard her version. I ain't know what the hell you said. <laughs> de la granja de la granja. Levántate de esa silla, Manuel. Levántate de esa silla, Manuel. Hay poca leche en la nevera. Hay poca leche en la nevera. Hay poca leche en la nevera. Leche. Hay poca leche en la if you threw moans behind this, I'd assume this was porn. Like, I have no idea what the hell she's saying. I, I was with the first couple of ones. <laughs> but if I'd heard it, if I'd heard it, I, Boca, I'd be like, what the fuck? What is this nigga watching on their phone? <laughs> Your computer tone that you've chosen for the voice is very suggestive. And I don't think you should be approaching a language like that. Coge esta botella y la llevas a la mesa. Game time. Just like that, dial it. All right, so now you got to hit me with some Spanish now that we done put this in the show. I'm going to leave that whole chunk in. What up with the Spanish? <laughs> <laughs> they going to be like, these niggas, wow. <laughs> these boys, wow. Sometimes we be having conversations and a nigga just stop and do a Spanish lesson. These conversations on wax, bro. This is how it go. Oh, man. Oh. Uh. For mm-hmm. me, for me, Spanish kind of like dirty talk. I can say my little shit, but when they respond, I already know what to say. <laughs> like, if I'm asking for week? some shit, <laughs> I'm saying like, okay, I need to find this. Point at it and I go get that. If you say some shit back, I... <laughs> It's been too long. You feel what I'm saying? There was a time when I could process it. And I'm still at a point to where I could kind of, I could understand, but I just can't respond because I have to think it and then translate it. And I don't have a vocab to translate it. 
right, even though right. I can understand it. You feel what I'm saying? Yeah. So I really I just tell you got what happened to my enemy myself. last week, did it? What happened? It was on your resume? Huh? You speak Spanish on your resume? I told him that. I, yeah, I was like, yeah, I speak a little Spanish. I was in my, they was like, well, we, we're right, right now we're looking for teachers who are uh, fluent in Spanish. I was like, well, I'm not fluent, but I can hold a conversation. It was, I was being interviewed by a man and a woman. The woman speak the fluent Spanish. <laughs> and he was like, he he like, he's like, miss so-and-so. And she started going into some shit. I said, I understood. And entiendes at the end, do I understand? Yes, I do. But I was like, I'm gonna need some time. I was like, can you write it down? <laughs> like, <laughs> Bro, they like, well, you're gonna have to have the kids not gonna be able to write it down. Like some of these kids may be in elementary school. I was like, <laughs> Yeah, I don't speak Spanish then. <laughs> Google got a uh Google Apple got an app on their phone called Translate. It comes standard with the phone in your app store. You could that's download that shit. Brown said that same shit. He was like, bro, you could do, man, you good, you good. You got that Google Translate shit, man. They got that out right now, bro. You can you can talk to that motherfucker. You can right there on the spot with that little kid, man. He, you can get what right what he need right then, I, bro. Yeah. Bro, they talking to it, and then it say in English what it think they was trying to say. And even if it ain't perfect, you be like, okay, I get your mention. <laughs> I hate See that, what though, you're aiming at. I'll tell you <laughs> I'm hating all. This, I'm taking all this effort to learn this goddamn language, man, and I could just nigga. From what I just heard, all it would be is the real life version of your Spanish lesson. Yeah, they say some shit in Spanish. You hear the English version. You can say it out loud if you feel like it. But if you just repeating what they say to you in Spanish, they probably gonna be like, "What's wrong with this nigga?" <laughs> But the application of hearing it in Spanish, hearing the English translation, and then doing something with it, they got to be some educational you could benefit from. I don't think the translation I heard you. Yeah. But yeah, man. Now that we just dead and having a random man conversation, I think this is a good place to wrap up. <laughs> Season one, episode three of Give Me Some Headline. Shouts out to my dog, P, man. Talk to the people. Man. Uh, something that you said the other day is stuck with me. And it's very simple, man, but we just don't think about it. And I'll end with this. It's two words. Two very, very simple words. Keep living and actually do some living. Like we about to do some living. And by we, I mean not just two hosts of this show. I also mean the people who consume this show. Um, You are now a part of the community uh, and we love the people in our community. So thank you for rocking with us these first three episodes. Um, we really appreciate you being here and supporting us. Uh, we will continue to be transparent. We know that if we tell you about our flaws, there's always truth in that. Like you won't, that's not anything, you won't second guess us telling you about the things that we've done that exposes our flaws. So if we expose enough of our flaws, you believe us when we're telling you some of the things you like, that's crazy. Like when we flexing, you'll believe about that we when we give you a product. When we give you a product and we say this product is the best product on the on the market that you can buy. This this music is the best music you could possibly consume. We will have exposed so many of our truths that you know we aren't lying about something like that and making those claims man. so we appreciate y'all for rocking with us and we will continue to bring you truly honest conversations products work life love keep living I'm here to get it started fuck being broken hearted